Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here at the National Alliance on Mental Illness of Georgia. And welcome to Beyond Breakdown from Bipolar to Schizophrenia. First, I'm going to give you some background information about my professional roles and how these relate to my newly published book, Breakdown, A Clinician's Experience in a Broken System of Emergency Psychiatry. Then I'm going to give some basic information about bipolar disorder and schizophrenia and some possible causes of these. I'm going to talk about the difference between the involuntary hold laws of Georgia and Massachusetts. Then I'm going to talk about Drew with untreated schizophrenia. And finally, I'm going to talk about some legislative reform initiatives of breakdown. So I'm a mobile emergency psychiatric social worker. And mobile means that I evaluate people anywhere in the community where crisis is occurring. This can be residential programs, homeless shelters, personal homes, police stations, holding cells of police stations, doctor's offices, even street sidewalks. My main role is to make sure that people are safe. And this involves preventing or decreasing danger. Um, for example, I evaluate a woman who has lost a lot of weight in the last couple of weeks, and she stopped eating because of her delusion. Her delusion involves her belief that her neighbors have been poisoning her food. Uh, she doesn't believe that she's ill, and my role is to ensure that she gets hospitalized. I make a lot of referrals to various levels of care. Most of these are not to inpatient units. For example, I refer people to psychotherapists. I give lists of support groups. I teach people how to improve their sleep hygiene without taking medication, et cetera. So Breakdown got published in October 2018. So why did I write this? I wrote this because of the many injustices that I saw in the clinical setting. And seeing these injustices motivated me to make a change beyond my place of employment. I didn't feel that that was enough. An example of injustice is discrimination. Inpatient units refuse to accept the most challenging cases. Another example of injustice is the prevalence of premature discharges being very high. And these are just a couple injustices. There are many injustices that I see in the clinical setting. And what I've seen has motivated me to advocate for change on a national level. This has involved connecting with a lot of family members throughout the country. And these family members have loved ones with serious mental illness. I heard their tragic stories and these stories inspired me to influence legislation. I testified a couple of times in favor of bills at the State House. I talked with, called, and wrote letters to legislators, and I joined the National Shattering Silence Coalition. This coalition advocates for the seriously mentally ill population. I noticed that there has been a disconnect between legislators and clinicians. It seems that a lot of legislators don't know what clinicians do. Breakdown closes that gap. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about bipolar disorder. 
Bipolar involves alternating or concurrent episodes of depression and mania or hypomania. It may or may not involve psychosis. And for the diagnosis to be made, mania or hypomania must last at least a week. The core symptom of schizophrenia is psychosis. Psychosis involves hallucinations, delusions, or disordered thinking. Fetal infection has been associated with the development of schizophrenia. The dominant theory of etiology for bipolar and schizophrenia involves genetics. We know that there are structural differences between healthy brains and brains of those with bipolar and schizophrenia. Now I'm going to give some context information surrounding the similarities and differences between the involuntary hold laws of Georgia and Massachusetts, where I'm from. The Treatment Advocacy Center is a national organization that promotes assisted outpatient treatment. I'm going to detail that later on. It advocates for a decrease in the criminalization of the mentally ill and for an increase in the number of inpatient beds, among many other initiatives. The Treatment Advocacy Center gives Georgia a grade B minus when it comes to mental health treatment. The Treatment Advocacy Center gives Massachusetts the grade F. This is because Massachusetts has no assisted outpatient treatment and Georgia does. Other than that, there's not much difference between our states. The criteria to qualify for inpatient in Georgia and Massachusetts is mostly similar. Both states have no psychiatric deterioration standard. This means that the laws don't care if someone has declined in functioning over the last few weeks. Both have a self-care standard requiring a high risk of harm, usually in cases of psychosis. However, the Treatment Advocacy <laughs> Center sees Georgia superior here. It refers to Massachusetts standard as, quote, unreasonable, unquote. A difference between Georgia and Massachusetts is in when the involuntary hold expires. Georgia's hold expires in 48 hours and Massachusetts hold expires in 72 hours. Now, I thought about this quite a bit, and if <laughs> there's no court interference in Georgia that would prevent a hospital emergency physician from releasing uh, the patient prematurely, there's not much difference here that I see as an emergency clinician. There's not much difference here because the hospital doctors have the power to discharge patients to the street at any time. So breakdown shows many examples of such doctors disagreeing with my involuntary hold authorizations and releasing them way before the 72 hours is up. In most states, the involuntary hold laws are overly restrictive. So with the exception of active suicidal ideation, they don't prevent danger. They require that danger be unfolding. The restrictive involuntary hold laws contribute to the revolving door that Drew enters. He often gets released to the streets from hospital emergency departments despite needing inpatient. Now I'm going to prepare you for learning about Drew. When illness progresses, agitation can occur. Agitation is 
accelerated and abnormal physical movements and verbalizations such as pacing, yelling, screaming, throwing and breaking objects or assaultiveness. With experience, I learned the association between agitation with psychosis and needing inpatient. So over time, I realized this pattern. Drew, a 45-year-old, is escorted to my office by a police officer. I quickly realized that he's profoundly psychotic. His clothes are filthy. He emits a foul odor. I can't understand what he's saying because he's jabbering so rapidly. And whenever I try to say anything, he interrupts me with nonsense and disorder. Despite being well known to many inpatient units, he's been without any medication for months. If he was given any prescription on discharge, he did nothing with it. He was evicted from his apartment earlier this week, I suspect related to psychosis. As I expected, this was not his first eviction. He can't explain any reason for the eviction. He has a long history of criminal offenses that he was charged with. These include inflicting serious assault on a psychiatrist on an inpatient unit, kidnapping, rape, possession of an unlicensed firearm, and stabbing a peer with a knife. A little less than two hours ago, Drew was released from a hospital emergency department. After the police brought him there on an involuntary hold, the doctor discharged him to the streets. In Massachusetts, the involuntary hold is called Section 12. He's not suicidal, he's not homicidal, but he's clearly psychotic. He tells me the only purpose in him coming here is for housing. He doesn't want any mental health treatment. I ask him, before the police brought you to the hospital, where were you resting your head? Drew replies, the police didn't bring me there. My fellow Marines did. They monitor my every move. They saw that Operation DP wasn't going so well. They had to intervene. I ask him, what's Operation DP? He says, I can't tell you. I'm a major on a mission ordered by the CIA. I ask, what did they order you to do? He replies, I can't tell you. He becomes agitated and yells, if you cannot get me a room for the night, I can leave. His body movements are restless. He's pacing. His hand gestures are animated. With the help of colleagues and some de-escalation techniques, I step away to fill out the Section 12 authorization. I do this out of his view because I don't want him to become more agitated. He likely knows what this is if he accidentally caught wind of me writing this authorization. Usually two police officers assist, but this time four officers arrive because they know his history of violence. He sees them and the presence of guns seems to um, be, be enough for him to not fight. He's probably thinking there's no point in fighting. There's, there's just no point with all these guns here. As the ambulance crew buckle him into the stretcher, he yells lots of profanities at me. They transport him to the same hospital he was released from earlier that day. I type my case, I get the insurance approval for inpatient, and then I get a call. The nurse from the hospital emergency room calls me saying, the doctor wants to know what you believe changed since we last released him. You didn't think that the doctor would do the same thing 
If you sent him here, the doctor's planning on releasing him again. I respond, nothing has changed since he was last released from there. He should have never been released. So the hospital releases him again to the streets. Inpatient units discriminate by declining to admit patients with Drew's potential for violence. It's likely that the hospital emergency room didn't want him to be there for any extended time. They might prefer that patients who require restraints be discharged sooner than patients without restraints. Why is this so? Well, it turns out that the use of emergency restraints burdens hospital resources. If a doctor orders restraints, the physical strength and mobility of additional staff members are required to enforce the order safely. Workers are expected to observe the restrained patient closely and continuously. There's an emotional burden on staff members. They tried verbal de-escalation techniques. When these didn't work, they provided a lot of empathy, offered the patient choices, set limits, all to no avail. The patient's inability to listen is a sign that restraints might be needed. And after the res restraints have been removed, they process the incident by talking with the patient and amongst themselves. The staff are required to complete additional documentation. All of these tasks take staff members away from attending to other patients. Breakdown shows a study in which restrained patients spend more time hospitalized in emergency settings than non-restrained patients. Certain inpatient units claim that they have extremely low restraint rates, but I wonder if they don't accept the most challenging cases. I suspect that these hospitals are the most selective in who they accept to treat. The wait for inpatient bed offers will be longer than average for patients with the following characteristics. Violence, not wanting any help, lack of health insurance, and expecting to present highly challenging barriers to discharge resulting in longer than average lengths of stay. Anyone who's been hospitalized knows someone who's been hospitalized or worked extensively with hospitals knows that they prefer the shortest lengths of stay. And the lengths of stay have dramatically declined in the last few decades. Breakdown proposes that legal consequences be imposed for such discrimination. Emergency programs doing bed searches could report to the government such discrimination and units could be closed if this is not resolved. Delusions don't always involve agitation. The police and I go to Sarah's home because she has burdened the police. She's called the police excessively because of her delusion. She's been calling them, asking that they get arrested. She's been asking that her neighbors get arrested because of her belief that they steal her belongings and they physically assault her. And this delusion remarkably doesn't interfere with her ability to attend to her basic biological needs. She's housed, well-nourished, well-groomed, and ironically, if she had wanted inpatient and qualified for this, she would not have faced discrimination. And the police and I left her home and wished her good luck. And it's likely that she continued to burden the police with excessive calls. But the law doesn't care about that. 
So now I'm going to talk about assisted outpatient treatment, referred to as AOT. Approximately half of people with schizophrenia or bipolar lack awareness of their illness. This is called anosognosia. Although the research shows this, I suspect that the rate is a lot higher. The psychosis involves the most anosognosia, and this results in treatment non-adherence. AOT is mandated outpatient treatment. It's usually ordered through a court, and the court order is vastly preferred because of the black robe effect. This means that recipients are highly likely to follow through with, the, with what the judge orders because the judge is in a position of power and authority. And despite anosognosia, some people with bipolar or schizophrenia take their medication. They see a correlation between not taking their medication and getting hospitalized. In fact, one case I recall involved bribery. Not me, I didn't bribe the person. <laughs> um, the only reason this client took his medication was bribery um, from his parents. His parents told me that the only way they got him to take his medication was by bribing him with food, shelter, and clothing. And when I ask such people, what is your medication for? They give me dubious explanations. For example, they say depression or PTSD. And all the research I found shows that AOT reduces rates of homelessness, incarceration, violence, readmission to inpatient units, and it also improves overall self-care. So it's very unfortunate that Massachusetts, Maryland, and Connecticut don't have AOT. All other states and the Washington DC allow AOT. Drew would have functioned much better with AOT. With anosognosia, he doesn't believe he needs any treatment. And a lot of research shows that anosognosia is the most common reason that people don't adhere to treatment recommendations. Breakdown strongly promotes AOT. In conclusion, I described bipolar and schizophrenia with some possible causes of these. I compared the involuntary hold laws of Georgia and Massachusetts. I talked about Drew with untreated schizophrenia, and I went over some legislative reform initiatives of Breakdown. Breakdown, a clinician's experience in a broken system of emergency psychiatry, is available at all major online stores. My website is lynnanos.com. Um, thank you for listening to Beyond Breakdown from Bipolar to Schizophrenia. And now I welcome any questions and comments. Fetal infection has been associated with uh, the development of schizophrenia. Is that from inoculation or? Um, I apologize, I don't know the details of okay. it. Yeah. And then my second question yes. was, you talked about doing the outpatient, the, the work that you do, the mobile work you do, do you go to prisons or jails? Uh, not prisons. I go to jails, um, particularly at uh, police stations. Yes. You mentioned in the book um, that the social worker does most of the work and spends the most time with the patient, mm -hmm. but has very little say in the treatment. And mm -hmm. can you explain the hierarchy of emergency psychiatry, just like from doctor, nurse, social worker? Sure, sure. 
Well, it's well known that in hospitals, the doctors have the most power. And in some cases that can be very ironic because the social workers um, oftentimes spend the most time with the patients. They know the patients extremely well. And there have been many times when I have made clinical recommendations and um, it didn't matter because the doctor did what she or he was going to do regardless what I've said. Of course, there are respectful doctors. There are doctors that are not so respectful. Um, it really depends on what doctor is being dealt with in the particular case. Um, but that hierarchy is, is, is very real. And um, I, I made a, a little point in the book in which um, social workers should be listened to a little bit more. Yeah. Why won't the doctor listen to the, why, why wouldn't they take your recommendation? Why, when is their goal for getting somebody out earlier than when somebody like you says they need to be there longer? Why, why does a doctor want to get them on the streets faster? Mm. My suspicion is that there is a lot of administrative pressure from above them. Um, hospitals are under tremendous pressure to keep the lengths of stay extremely short. And um, malingering comes to mind a lot in this conversation. Um, malingering is extremely common in emergency services. And um, I have come across overly cautious doctors, doctors that even with a little suicidal ideation that's that's clearly not there, but getting re getting reported by the patient because the patient just wants sh food and shelter. Um, but me seeing through this, the doctor is is overly cautious and not wanting to get sued because of the chance of this person going out and killing himself. Whereas, um, whereas after I have seen this particular patient well over 50 times and clearly know that he's never going to kill himself, they want to be on the cautious side. Have there been any HIPAA changes in your state? No. Okay. No. Yes, I, I am aware that a lot of family members have a lot of problems problems with HIPAA and they want major HIPAA reform. And th that, that is included in, in breakdown. I, I suggest um, a solution for, for that. Yeah. Do you have any experience on that, um, what happens in New York? Because um, my, I have experience with my twin sister in New York and she's been hospitalized in long term over 12 times, but they have kept her. Now coming to Georgia, I'm getting a sense that people are released immediately. And, and she hasn't been released in a week. Most times it takes two to three months. Um, there's paranoia and all the other kinds of things going on. So I'm still trying to grasp what happens in Georgia, why they release them so quickly. And in New York, she has not been released in, until she's almost. And even there were times when they might have wanted to do it in two, two months, well, three months. And she still, in my mind, wasn't as stable as I thought she should be. But they released her then, but it wasn't 42, 72 hours, it wasn't 48 hours, hmm. or any of those kinds of things. I'm grappling with what ha what's happening here that's different, or even in the other states that you're talking about. Hmm. Um, so you're, you're, you're saying that, that the, the hospitals are releasing her a lot quicker here than in New York. The people here, she's not here. I, she's still in New York. I didn't bring her. I planned uh -huh. to. But once I got here, I realized that there were certain things that needed to be really reinforced or developed better, so I didn't bring her. Mm -hmm. um, but what I'm saying is that in New York, she was kept in the hospital for three months, two months. She was not released 
was it 72 hours or 48 hours? Mm -hmm. um, and in 48 hours or 72 hours, there would have been no difference. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm trying to figure out, I can see that. How come other people can't see it here if, if she were here? Mm -hmm. There'd be no way that you could release her in 72 hours. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I agree with you. I'm sorry, I don't know a lot about the, the New York system. However, um, a very great uh, resource that I mentioned in my lecture is the Treatment Advocacy Center. If you go on their website, they break down the difference between all the states. And actually, that's where I learned about the, the difference the differences between uh, here and Massachusetts. So you can easily find it on the Treatment Advocacy Center site. My wife, I think, has uh, depression and uh, paranoid schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. uh, I filed for involuntary hospitalization two years ago. She was in the hospital for 72 hours, came back home, and um, because of HIPAA, I had no clue as to what they found, what was her medical diagnosis. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get her parents take over the guardianship mm -hmm. and the court uh, appointed a psychologist or psychiatrist to come in our house and then evaluate her. Mm -hmm. They came in yesterday or day before yesterday and she told them, get out of my property. Mm -hmm. So they said, okay, well, I'm here as per the court order to tell you that I've been assigned to evaluate you because your parents want to take the guardianship to take you to Austin and uh, help get you medical help. Uh, but she said, I don't wanna, I don't want, they're too old, they're gonna die very soon. I don't wanna go to Austin, I live here, I have a house here, and I don't want you on my property to get out. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I went back. So there is, I can't, she doesn't listen to whatever I say, mm -hmm. uh, but she has these symptoms for at least nine, 10 years. She mm -hmm. has never taken, she doesn't go to the doctor, never, mm -hmm. Apart from one uh, 1013 thing I did, mm -hmm. she has not been seen by anybody. Mm -hmm. Now she's doing things every day, which I can't control mm -hmm. uh, other than just follow her and make sure she's okay. She's been driving on suspended driver's license for more than a year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know what else can I do to really get her to either realize that she needs medical help mm -hmm. or somehow take her to, mm -hmm. or bring her to the, to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Well, I've heard from a lot of advocates that that AOT is underutilized in the states that allow it. So I am curious about what AOT is like in Georgia. I can speak from a yeah. friend's perspective. She's not here, but her son's used AOT, and it's phenomenal. Huh. Okay. I don't know that it's being underutilized. Okay. Okay. What county is she in? He's in Augusta. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what is AOT? Oh, it's assisted outpatient treatment. It's court mandated outpatient treatment. Yeah. So Vivek, your your story is is not in isolation, um, which is why you're here, and hopefully you can. Um, get the support that you need um, uh, in meeting other people like yourself. I mean, she, my wife is very smart. So like yeah. if I try to hide the keys or do things in, she'll find a solution to, to meet me. So I can't really control her to say, stay mm -hmm. at home, tell me mm -hmm. what you want, I'll get it, stay here. Mm -hmm. She wants to go out and maybe get some fresh air, but mm -hmm. it's, I mean, she, after my daughter was born, she started watching a lot more TV, which I thought she was just getting bored. But she was watching TV 10 hours a day. And for a while, she was watching things she really liked. So she was watching Food Channel and cooking and uh, shopping on the network and all. But slowly that changed to watching anything which is there on the TV. So watching cartoon, turn off the volume, cartoon is going on the whole day, which kind of started scaring me to say, you know what? If you're watching things you really like and care, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. But watching things you don't care, just have the TV on and stare at it, mm -hmm. and then do it for 10 hours, 11 hours a day, mm -hmm. every day for like seven years, eight years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I can't seem to get her out of the... the how, how do you get the court to order that AOT? How, what's the process there? Um, well, 
keep in mind, Massachusetts doesn't allow it. Uh -huh. And uh, in other states, outpatient treaters or family members can petition the court. Inpatient units can petition the court as well. He lives by himself. He's basically squatting in a rental house that we have. He hasn't worked in a year. He probably hasn't bathed, I know, at least three, four months. Mm -hmm. He's, you know, growing his beard and mm -hmm. he's constantly saying they're trying to kill him. He's pulling wires mm -hmm. out the walls because the wires are talking to him. Mm -hmm. And he's destroying mm -hmm. the house. He said they tried to kill him. He broke windows. Mm -hmm. I went to the police station and I said, he's like breaking windows, pulling wires out the walls. You know, he's coming up with all these stories. CIA waterboarded him the other night and all this stuff. And he said, and I told him, I said, he's been to Kennestone twice. He's been to the Cobb Behavior Center. I brought him um, to the um, the... I brought him to a holistic doctor. I brought him to a psychiatrist. And then he tells me, he says, well, it seems like you have, you brought him to a lot of professionals. Maybe there's nothing wrong. I mean, all of these tragic stories are why we advocate at the State House.